But I believe that by overwhelming majority in all the Americas, you and I in the long run, and if it be necessary, you and I will act together to protect, to defend by every means at our command. Welcome to the History in Motion podcast, where we discuss leaders, their decisions, and how they shape the world we live in today. In this episode of the History in Motion podcast, we dive into the revolutionary life of Vladimir Lenin, the mastermind behind the Bolshevik Revolution and the founder of the Soviet Union. Spurred by his brother's execution, he became determined to dismantle the oppressive Tsarist regime. His return during World War I set the stage for the October Revolution of 1917, which toppled the provisional government. But was he a liberator for the people, or did his tactics pave the way for totalitarianism? We'll explore his controversial policies during the Russian Civil War and their lasting impact on Russia and the world. Join us as we unravel the profound legacy of Vladimir Lenin during one of history's most turbulent times. This is the History in Motion podcast. Welcome back, everyone, to the History in Motion podcast, where we are wrapping up our journey through Russian history today. And as, over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about Tsar Nicholas II, we've talked about Rasputin, and we talked about how there's a big shift coming from the Tsarist Russian Empire into communist Soviet Union. And there's one man that kind of leads all of that and really moves Russia into a drastic new future, and that's Vladimir Lenin. And I'm going to start with a quote from him that I think kind of wraps up, I think, his life and everything that's happening at this time so well. He says, there are decades where nothing happens, and there are weeks where decades happen. Wow. Yeah, not wow. a bad start, eh? Wow. That's I think it was, powerful. It is, right? Powerful. Because... This is what we're going to see with his life, right, is he's going along, he's learning about communism and Marxist theory and all of these things. And then just really quickly, you know, the czar is assassinated, the provisional government's overthrown, and all of a sudden he's in power. And that is decades of change all happening within a few weeks. And sure, it's a slow rise to that. But I think that really goes to show that there's definitely a slow burn here. But then when it happens... Everything happens so quickly and Russia has changed, not just a little bit, like forever. And the world has changed forever because the Soviet Union and communism is going to shape the last hundred years of history, maybe even more. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be a really good episode today as we, we see the man who kind of spearheads that change and really puts his stamp on world history. It's such a good point, too. Not just in the context of, of Lenin, obviously, because we're talking about him and he's our focus for today. But this idea of like, you know, decades happening in weeks, I love that framing because, you know, we're obviously looking at very key pivotal figures in, in the lead up to the, you know, the modern world. And sometimes it can seem like all these things are happening so quickly and so fast. But the reality is there's just kind of this like frenetic energy that is happening over, you know, decades over somebody's life. And then it culminates into that match being lit. And then next thing you know, that powder keg just implodes. And, you know, you see like a such a transformational shift happen, essentially, what seems like it's overnight, but really has been, you know, decades in the making. Absolutely. And we see in different parts around Europe and around the world where mm -hmm. that match never fully gets lit, or maybe a small part of it kind of lights up and they're able to push things down and that change happens slower. But in places like France and places like Russia, even places like Germany, really really quickly, long changes that are you expect to happen can sometimes veer off in one direction. And, you know, that's when those decades happen in a week. So there's a lot to get into today with with Lenin. So we're going to jump right into it and talk about him and his early life. So Vladimir Ilyich Ulanov, which is his full name, was he's known as Lenin, but that was his full name. And we'll get into why a little bit later. He was born on April 22nd, 1870 in Sibrisk, Russia. He grew up in a middle class family, valued education, kind of very typical middle class family. His father was an inspector for schools. And an interesting detail about his life is he lived in a, in a household that valued education, learning new things, doing well in school were highly valued. And his father and mother encouraged all the children to read widely, to think critically and to kind of challenge ideas if they didn't think they were right. And so right away from what we know with Lenin is he's someone who sees this new Marxist theory come through and really takes hold of it later in his life. And we can see it right as a young boy, really, at this point, he's opening his mind, he's trying new things, you know, he's still kind of constrained to, you know, the household and school and everything like that. But he definitely has the mindset and the drive to start thinking and thinking differently, reading different things and not just, you know, taking what he's told and you know, calling it a day. It's so interesting having done almost 50 of these episodes. 
you know, it's, I think it's so easy to gloss over somebody's childhood and like the environment that they're raised in. But when you when you say those like kind of key things around, you know, his mom and dad were really focused on their children having, you know, being educated, reading broadly, thinking critically. You can kind of see you see so much foreshadowing in so many of our episodes. I think with Lennon, it's it's really the, the relationship there is is so obvious because obviously we obviously associate him, him with communism or his flavor of communism, which we'll talk about later is Leninism all of the writings that he did, how he kind of became the forefront of this movement. It's so interesting how those kind of like very broad swaths of just ideas and kind of urging your children to do something can really shape where they end up going in life. And, you know, I think it's often understated when we look at historical figures. But, you know, for this, when you said that, I think it's so important to like really just understand how formative those very broad ideas are. It's just a really good point because... You're right. We gloss over it and we almost see it as an inevitability a lot of times like, oh, of course he was. But sometimes when you kind of go through the bio, you're like, oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense on who we know who he is. But even it's such a footnote right in his life. So even when I was reading a few different bios on him, it would be, you know, to be a couple points about his family life. And then it just jumps to the next event in his life. And it's like, so Lennon was 15 when this happened. And it's like, okay, well, 15 years have gone by of him being raised in this environment and going to school and doing these things that are really starting to mold his mind. And, you know, 15, he's really starting to, you know, grow into a young man at this point. So he's again this 15 years of learning and being educated and, you know, being told to think critically by his parents and definitely taking a lot of value into that. But then, as I said, 15, he turns 15 and tragedy strikes for him. So he was very close with his father, but his father passes away of a brain hemorrhage when he's 15 years old. And this kind of turns Lennon into a bit of an erratic kid. He starts being very much more confrontational. He actually denounces his belief in God, which, as we talked about last couple episodes, being Russian and being part of the Orthodox Church was a big thing for a lot of Russians. And, you know, definitely pushing back against that was definitely seen as a little bit of a radical move. And I think for Lenin, right, we've seen he's he's grown up being able to think critically, challenge things that he doesn't understand. But now he's lost someone really important in his life and, you know, being 15 and still being young, trying to find his place in the world. I think the the erraticness is definitely kind of coming from some of that ability to think critically. And he's starting to look at everything in his life. And, you know, maybe it's a little bit of youth rebellion on his side as well. But you can really start to see that uh, he's starting to mold himself into a bit more of a maybe a radical thinker when it comes to, you know, what a traditional Russian would look at look like at this time. Yeah, I think that's uh, for any young person, you know, 15 is not old by any stretch of the imagination to lose someone as important as your father that early in your life is going to it's going to upend your entire worldview. Right. And whatever whatever that ends up looking like could create a very different person. And I think, you know, to your point that you just mentioned, he begins to question everything. And I think this is a a theme that we're going to see, you know, throughout his bio and throughout the context that we're going to, you know, get to is that he's a very deep thinker. He's a very critical thinker. Maybe even too much. (laughs) You know, the jury's out on that, but we'll we'll get there. Absolutely, yeah. And it gets even worse for him too, right? So he's already kind of, he's lost, you know, definitely the most important male figure in his life. But he does have an older brother who's still someone he looks up to and has a lot of influence with. But the next year in 1887, his brother is executed for participating in a plot to assassinate Tsar Nicholas III. So his involvement, um, this is his brother's involvement, was with a radical group group called the People's Will, and it failed. He was caught and assassinated. And so right away, Lenin has lost two very, very important people in his life. And now he's got someone to start blaming, right? Before it was more, hey, I'm young, I'm rebelling, I'm trying a bunch of different things. But now he has someone to point to. And that's the czarist regime. You know, you killed my brother. I'm, you know, I'm going to work towards whether it's taking them out or moving in a different direction. But he's definitely not looking up to the czar and having any sort of kind feelings towards him. He's definitely seeing, you know, these revolutionary politics as the direction that he's going to start moving in. So he does that by going to school. And we see this with a lot of people around this time is it's education at a university level is not just reserved for the super elite and wealthy anymore. There's this middle class that's starting to come up and, and start to get educated. So Lenin did very, very well in high school. He graduated with honors. He was very, very smart, an exceptional student. So he enrolls at the 
at the Kazan Imperial University to study law, but was expelled shortly after due to participating in a student demonstration. So you you can start to see this radical element of him of clearly very, very intelligent, but clearly very, uh, not not antisocial, but just very likes to push back against very Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, argumentative, that kind of stuff doesn't doesn't want to uh, be very agreeable about anything. So he gets kicked out of school. But he keeps studying, sees that value of education that's been instilled in him by his parents, and he completes his studies independently and then completes his law examinations at the exter- as an external student at the St. Petersburg University. So, you know, he's someone who's very clearly intelligent, can clearly do what he needs to do to get his um, his law degree. But during this time, too, he starts to immerse himself in the world of Karl Marx, Frederick Eigels, and he's t- particularly influenced by Marx's dust capital, which shaped his understanding of capital societies and class struggle. Lenin began to see himself as part of this vanguard who would lead the Russian people to overthrow the bu- bourgeoisie, like moving a lot of these people up and taking out kind of that elite class. So you can really see where this is starting to come together for him. And again, now he's just needed the right radical ideas to, I think, point himself in the right direction. And for him, I think, you know, he's found his calling a little bit. And, you know, that's the work of Karl Marx and Frederick Eigels. And this, you know, anti-capitalist movement is uh, is something that he's going to take, you know, it's almost going to replace religion for him in a sense. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, and I think that's something we'll definitely get into a little bit later in the episode. And, you know, maybe just a couple of points, more contextual and more of a backdrop against what we're talking about here. So what we, we just covered at a high level, maybe 20 some odd years of his life, Paul, I imagine. Yeah, about that. Yeah. So in that 20 years, he's lost his father, he's lost his brother, tried to assassinate the czar. And this is all happening against the backdrop of a very strictly controlled uh, czarist autocracy in Russia. You know, you have the idea of like the divine right of kings, you have socioeconomic conditions that were extremely dire, particularly for the peasantry. You know, we've talked uh, at length in our last couple episodes about the emancipation of the serfs, which in theory sounds nice, but actually caused, you know, more economic hardship due to insufficient land and high redemption payments. You know, this, the, the mere system of communal land ownership essentially disc- discouraged agricultural innovation and didn't do much to actually uplift peasants uh, from their state of poverty. It actually kind of weighed them down more. And you also have a Russian society that's also somewhat changing in terms of their economic sector. So you have industrialization beginning to take hold. It's leading to the growth of these urban centers as peasants migrate to the cities to search for work. But again, because of how stratified the society is, the urban proletariat, and you know, we're going to start using some of those terms, faced very poor working conditions, low wages, again, overcrowded living environments, which continue to grow this like this level of discontent across you know the broader swath of the population. And I think also probably to your point on education, which I think is really really interesting. So as a as a part of you know this Russification program that's happening, you know there's there is a degree of importance and prioritization put on education as a way to ironically help build up those uh, you know the lower classes to be able to to read and improve literacy rates, but you know only to a certain degree, right? We don't want you thinking too much, which is always the catch twenty two. So you see education kind of becoming this tool of control and a breeding ground for dissent. You know to your point, you know he's doing really well in school, but you know, he is someone who's going to push back when he doesn't agree with something. And that's probably why he was expelled, because you see, you know, these intellectual circles that are flourishing, these private gatherings, but there's more government oversight because people don't want you, you know, those radical ideas kind of growing and fomenting any more than they have to. Yeah, it's funny when you see things like this is anytime these ideas get suppressed, right, they always Mm -hmm. grow and become a little bit more radical. And I think to all the things that you outlined of all these quote unquote reforms that have happened in Russia, Russia is still very much autocratic very much in the old ways where you see a lot of Europe starting to transition into, you know, pseudo democracies, constitutional monarchies, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, you can see that democracy is going to come at some point um, as time goes on. But Russia, we don't really see that. And I think part of these reforms not really doing what people think they're going to do can really just see people say, well, the whole system is broken. It doesn't matter what we do. There's no reforming. It needs to be torn down and we need something brand new. And that's where Lenin comes in. So with Lenin, he's becoming really a prominent figure in the late 
19, a, sorry, 1890s, uh, a prominent figure in these revolutionary circles. His political activities, particularly his role in organizing strikes and publishing anti-government propaganda, you know, he's going to start to gain some notoriety. And one thing about Lenin and the Bolsheviks, as we'll get into later, is they love to put out newspapers, books, any sort of material that people could read. Because again, people are being more educated now. Literacy rates are much higher. People are going to read this stuff. And again, if they're upset about the czar, you know, this is going to be stuff that's really going to radicalize them and, and get them moving in the direction that Lenin wants. But again, the authorities, like you said, they're not going to take this lying down. So in 1895, Lenin is arrested and exiled to Siberia, where he spent three years. So during this time, he continued to work. Uh, sorry, he continued his work, which was writing extensively on revolutionary theory and corresponding with a few exiled revolutionaries. So he's he's out there. He's got time to to really think even deeper. He's not really doing much other than you know being in prison slash you know doing some manual labor within within that system. So he's he's really sitting and thinking on these ideas and. One thing I, I liked about kind of doing the research here is I'm, I'm getting this picture of Lenin in my head of sitting there late at night with candlelight, trying to read through everything. He's very stoic, very cold, very just I'm here to do a job. But some historians actually say that's one of the biggest falsehoods about Lenin was that he was just this quiet, icy kind of person, very one dimensional you know, just a very clever, just moving things around. And that kind of comes to with that he loved to play chess a lot. So people I think are starting to say, you know, he's got this tactical mind and that's the kind of things that he wants to do. But in fact, people who are around him say he was a very, very emotional person. He would wear kind of mm. what he thought, you know, right out in the open. And he was known for going into these basically tantrums, these huge um, amounts of rage would come over him and he would just get so angry. And, you know, it'd be think of a guy just like screaming for a while and then just sitting down and just being exhausted. And that's what some people People say like Lenin would just go on these tirades and then would just have to like sit down because he almost wore himself out with so much emotion. So I think it's important to think about as we see Lenin as not just this guy sitting there reading books and trying to write a new theory or something. He's definitely someone who does that, but he's also got a very, very emotional side and I'm sure a very passionate side as well, which I'm sure is going to do wonders for him as he starts to preach his ideas, people are going to start to see that passion come through in that emotion versus just, you know, reading words on a page. It's interesting because I feel like the idea of him sitting by the candlelight, you know, uh, just pouring over his notes, books spread everywhere. It's all this is a very romantic picture, right, of this intellectual person just, you know, in a cave somewhere, just just surrounded by his ideas and other people's ideas to, to come up with something new. Uh, I don't know why we always tend to like view that as, as, as an idea idea or like this romantic image of people, you know, not similar to Lenin, but, you know, these kind of great thinkers or like really pivotal historical figures. But you mentioned, Paul, that he was he's probably reading some books at this point in his time. And I think, you know, it's probably a good point uh, in the conversation to maybe talk a little bit about Marxist literature and <laughs> with a deep and en with a with enough depth to get our listeners to understand what we're talking about without inundating them with a what could be a three hour conversation between the differences of Marxism and Leninism. But we'll try not to do that. So in terms of what he's reading, he's obviously very, very influenced by Karl Marx. And Karl Marx was born in 1818 in Prussia. He died in 1884 while Vladimir Lenin was still alive, but he was still a young boy. And this is a very interesting breakaway from like what I guess most systems of economic theory were thinking about this time. Marxism, which was developed by Marx and Engels, is this theoretical framework that essentially is a critique of capitalism. And it's Vision is a classless, stateless society achieved through spontaneous, this is a very interesting word, proletarian revolution in advanced industrial nations. It really emphasizes historical materialism, the labor theory of value, and the inevitable collapse of capitalism due to its internal contradictions. So here comes Lenin, who is fascinated by these ideas. He sees how some of this is actually happening, that the, that the seeds of destruction within capitalism capitalist societies are sowed by the very origins of these systems. But it doesn't necessarily fit with his worldview and what he sees as how it's going to apply in Russia. So then you have this theory that is now known as Leninism, which is formulated by him, which kind of adapts Marxism to the early 20th century conditions of Russia. It advocates for a disciplined vanguard party to lead the revolution. And like the Vanguard Party, to me, essentially reads like a group of professional revolutionaries who are uh, working at the interest of the proletarian class that they are representing, which to me is already like, OK, that great idea in theory. I don't know how practical it's going to be. And, uh, we're going to get there. 
but they're essentially incorporating the peasantry as this revolutionary force and accepting that socialism can be established in a single, less developed country. And I think the similarities are both ideologies essentially want to overthrow capitalism. You know, there's no denying that. They want to establish communism. But Leninism kind of breaks away from Marx by emphasizing the need for a centralized party to guide the proletariat. And the reason or the rationale behind that is because they need the support for a strong state apparatus, including, as we'll see, authoritarian measures. So you can see a bit of a, a contradiction and an irony here uh, to, to vend against the revolution. And you want to expand on Marx's ideas, kind of took it a step further by analyzing imperialism. So if we're thinking about the world a, a, at this point in time, these are imperial powers that are vying for you know status amongst each other in Europe. So Lenin kind of posits the idea that imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism. So Lenin kind of modifies Marx's principle to address the practical challenges of revolution governance in a very specific historical and socioeconomic context. I always find it funny how imperialism always comes up in the Soviet Union as a bad thing that they're always you know, pointing at the West for. But when you look at the Russian Empire, it is an incredibly imperialist state. When you look at mm-hmm. all of the small countries around its borders, that it kind of collapses into this Russian Empire. I always find it funny that that always comes up. But you're right, like this is a very much more radicalized version of a lot of what Marx was saying, but even kind of some more of the maybe more left-leaning pro-labor, pro-union type of movements that we're seeing across Europe. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me a little bit of when we talked about Gavrilo Princip and Archduke Franz Ferdinand Mm -hmm. around how Gavrilo was in a world where his parents and that generation were all about Hey, uh, we'll get to these reforms. It's going to take some time, but we're going to do it through the political system and we're going to fight for our rights. It's going to take time, but we're going to do it. Where Gavrilo and a lot of these young, educated men were like, that ain't happening. That's taking too long. We're going to do something radical and get this moving quickly. And you can see that right away with Lenin here, right? Having that revolutionary guard and kind of group of basically an army or slash secret police slash, you know, authority figure that can come in and crack some skulls when they need to, but then also having that centralized control. So when things are going off the rails, you can push things back in the direction that you think based on whatever Lenin's ideology is at that time. So yeah, there's definitely a piece of this where it's not just, hey, we're going to push for change. No, it's we're going to get change and we're going to get it our way and we're going to do it by force if necessary, because I think a lot of these revolutions, and they've probably seen a bunch of them fail because they're, you know, they're trying to do it the right way and mm-hmm. you know, they want to get things done and they, they realize that you know violence and power is, is one way to getting what you need, regardless of your ideology. It's so interesting like doing, I probably got a little bit deeper than I should have on the comparison or the comparative analysis between Marxism and Leninism and where I thought Marxism kind of fell short in terms of its plan, you know, outside of its obvious failures is that there wasn't really a plan, right? Like there was just this idea that the workers of the world would unite, which sounds great. You know, it's very romantic. It sounds like something potentially worth striving for. But with Lenin, you kind of see this um, very strategic, pragmatic and tactical lens in which he's kind of approaching it. Just like, well, how do we actually execute against this? And I think that to me is is really indicative of someone who wants to create meaningful change in a way that it's sustainable and actually can happen without just sitting and thinking about ideas without actually putting them into action. Absolutely. Yeah, he's we would we'll see this theme with Lenin a lot is he's very ideologically driven, but he's also very pragmatic. And I think this to your point, right? He's reading Marx going, Hey, I like all of these things, but I'm gonna add a little bit of my flavor to it and it's ends up being wildly successful. So he definitely knows what he's doing there, but he's got a lot more of his life to get through before he kind of gets to the part of his life where we can really see that kick into high gear. So he's released from prison after three years and he moves to Western Europe and he spends almost 17 years all around Europe. So he's lived in Zurich, London, Paris. You know, he can work more freely. He can do what he needs to do and he can meet a lot of other people who are like-minded. So this is where he kind of formulates that vision that you spoke about that what leninism really means he also becomes leader of the bolshevik faction of the russian social democratic labor party and he continues to to write and kind of outline all the things that you mentioned so from this though he's starting to be seen as more of a radical so a couple things is within his party he's already seen as a radical a lot of people don't take him seriously they think he's too extreme and they think like there's no way this is going to work like there's parts in some of his strategies of we're going to abolish the banks, we're going to abolish the police, we're going to abolish all of these czarist 
institutions and rebuild them with something better. And so a lot of people are like, okay, well, we can't abolish the banks. We can't abolish the police. This is crazy, right? Like we, these are structures to our society that you can't just get rid of. We need to find a way to bring, you know, slower change in. And there's another group called the Menshkovits, which are another group of left-leaning political uh, activists within Russia who think very similar to Lenin, but way less extreme. They're like, okay, we can we can get these changes through, but it's going to take time. We're going to it's going to be more broad. It's going to be a little bit more democratic, but it's not going to be as revolutionary. And so you can see that a collision course is is happening very quickly. But Lenin continues to push this. You know, there's the revolution part of this that needs to happen. There's a centralized control. There's this revolutionary guard that needs to come with everything. And he consistently says, without theory, there can be no revolutionary party. But what he also says after that is, theory is a guide, not a holy right. So we see two pieces to him here. He's saying this revolution needs to happen through theory. But at the end of the day, theory is just a guide. If we need to make changes along the way, we'll do it. We got to be successful. This is the, you know, the most important thing. And that actually causes him some challenges with people because you have a lot of people who are following him for his strong ideology. But then he starts changing his mind because he realizes that he needs to move on a different path. He really starts to find that people People were kind of pushing back a lot against that. But I think that's the, if I were to take one thing away from Lenin, I think that's probably his strongest suit is he's able to think so deeply about this theory, get people on board, but then make changes. He doesn't have to sit there. He's not a religious leader who's saying, no, it's not written in the Bible. It's not written in the Quran. It's not written in the Torah. It's not written in our holy books. We can't do it. He's kind of got his holy book, but he's deviating as he needs to. And I think that's, you know, really a key thing about him is he's able to do that. So after all this time in Europe, he comes back to, he starts making, so he doesn't come back to Russia quite yet, but he is coming back to um, meet other people in the Bolshevik party. And one thing that we'll, we'll, we'll see a lot is people didn't believe it was actually him so you got to think right he's away right and he's writing all these things down and people are reading it all over europe and when he would walk into places people like you're lenin how do we know you're lenin and he would start speaking and people start to figure it out and we'll see that when he returns to russia he meets the leaders of the bolshevik party and he's like i'm here it's lenin and they're like really who's this guy or he just walks in and no one knows who he is so it's just a funny thing that we'll start to see as he really takes this leadership role through his ideas, but he's not really running the propaganda machine to, you know, put his face out there and make people know who he is part of because he still kind of has to run, you know, in the shadows a little bit because there's a big, powerful czarist regime that's, you know, not too happy with, the, you know, the things that he's spewing. So this is kind of who he is. And he's really kind of entrenched in this ideology. And you know, he's really starting to start thinking about how can I actually put this into action? It's one of the interesting things that stood out to me while doing like the the contextual research is that I think for for most people who have some what of an understanding of Lenin, they see him as an ideologue, which I think is 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 more or less pretty accurate. You know, he has an ideology that he is uh, very passionate about and trying to figure out how he can actually implement it to to make the transformational changes he wants. But the part that really stuck out to me, and you, you kind of uh, touched on a little bit at the beginning there, was it's like he's editing in real time. Like he's trying to adapt it because he's like, ah, wait, you know, this this component, you know, like this section doesn't really make sense when you think about it because it's, it's not really going to help us. It doesn't, it's not going to get us to achieve our goal in a meaningful way. And it might actually hinder us. So maybe we have to change. And I think, you know, it's interesting to see that in him as someone who's so passionate and so deeply entrenched in his work, but not being so forthright with it that he isn't able to take a step back and say, we might need to pivot a little bit. Absolutely. And that's the hallmark of all these great leaders we've talked about is they're able to make decisive, quick decisions when they need to. And they're not stuck on, I think it's two things, right? That stuck in their ways, I'm not going to change, even though the evidence is provided in front of me, or they kind of hum and haw and they think about it a little bit and they don't actually execute the change they need to. I think we're seeing both with Lenin, right? He's able to, you know, move in the right direction when he needs to, but he's not there thinking about it. Oh, I got to, you know, let me go write another novel about how I might change my mind here. He's like, no, we'll, we'll make a decision. We need to get it done. And we'll see that as he runs into power. One interesting thing though about Lenin, and you'll, if you remember from the beginning of the episode, I introduced his name and it's not Lenin. It's coming completely different. Vladimir is still the same, but his last name is completely different. And this is actually something that was very common amongst Russian revolutionaries is they kind of had these pseudo pseudo names. So he started out by going by the name of Ketulin. He called himself Petrov for a while and then eventually settled on Lenin in 1902. Some historians believe it was a reference to the Lena River in Siberia, but we see this with a lot of Russian revolutionaries. So for example, Joseph Stalin, I'm not even going to pronounce 
attempt to pronounce his name, but it's a very Georgian name that does nothing close to Joseph Stalin. Leon Trotsky was known as Lev Bornstein. So you can start to see that part of it is for safety, right? You don't want to be throwing your family name around. You just, who's this guy, Lenin? And I think it provides a little bit of mystery too of, mm-hmm. you know, we say it's like, you know, artists today that just go by one name, right? And Lenin just it kind of has a nice marketing appeal to it. And so I'm sure that also helps kind of a little bit with the fanfare and mystery around him. But at the same time, it's keeping them safe and making sure that, you know, their name isn't on blast. And it makes it a little bit more tricky for the czarist regimes to track these guys down and figure out actually who they are. That's very interesting. Yeah, I can see that it does add that layer of intrigue and mystery to this revolutionary thinker who has been away for, you know, uh, almost two decades. And obviously, you know, the safety component's huge. You know, um, I'm sure the czarist regime is keenly aware of who Lenin is at this point in time or you know what his real name is and if they get their hands on him you know as we've seen in previous episodes it's not going to be good he's going to end up out of Russia probably somewhere in Siberia in you know a, in a labor camp absolutely that's kind of the the tried and true method that it's funny of the things that that stay from the Tsarist regime it's the the system of prison camps in Siberia it doesn't just stay it gets launched into high gear with Stalin and the gulag system but it's a good idea is a good idea, right? Yeah, exactly. They're like, oh, this kind of works. I can see why they did it, right? So we look at Lenin now, right? He's got his ideas. He's got a lot of followers. But at the same time, right, there's no way he's going to be able to launch a revolution. He doesn't have the manpower. He doesn't have the support. The people are like, life is tough enough as it is. Do we really need to go to war for our revolutionary ideas? But World War One kicks off. And this is the perfect opportunity because people don't want to go to war. Now they're forced to go to war and they're doing quite poorly. So Lenin sees this and he goes perfect from an ideological standpoint. I'm going to really push back against all of this. He says, this is just a war amongst imperialists struggling for capitalist powers and all socialists should oppress it. He's advocating instead of war transformation. He says, instead of going into this war, we should use this as a chance for a revolution. He had this anti-war stance, even actually made him controversial amongst some socialists, many of whom were you know, very patriotic, saying, you know, may not agree with this war, I may not agree with anything, but it's my job as a Russian to defend my country. And so the fact that even Lenin is speaking out against this, it is pushing away some of those more moderate socialists. But as we'll start to see, Lenin's just going to start to grow this radical group and eventually get them powerful enough. So with the war going very poorly, this is just, again, we're going to bring over some of the things we talked about the last couple of weeks, but you know, the Russian economy by 1917 is in ruin, the military is demoralized, public unrest is at its all-time high. And then in February 1917, there was an uprising and Tsar Nicholas II was forced to abdicate. 300 years of the Romanov rule is over. A provisional government is established. Everyone's excited thinking, okay, they're going to get us out of the war. But this government kind of does nothing. They don't they don't face a lot of these key issues around famine and a lot of the economic issues that are happening. Definitely some land reform stuff because that's kind of the theme of the day. But then they continue the war. And this really upsets a lot of people. So we're sitting at this point to where we talked about powder kegs, right? People are upset. People think the czar is gone and things are going to change. And then you kind of have this passive government who comes in that's not really doing what the people want. And it's a really, really good time if you're a revolutionary to kind of get your the people on your side because things are going to blow up in a big, big way. And you can, you know, you can probably feel the electricity in the air that's happening here because people just want things to settle down and they're just not ha- they're not changing despite you know, changes at the very highest level. I think it's such a good, I know we just cleaned over like 30 years. <laughs> it's some of the most important like history in Russia. We just, oh yeah, it's a couple sentences, but yeah. And I think, you know, we can't spend uh, as much as we'd love to, you know, hours talking, you know, decade by decade, year by year. But I think, you know, for our listeners, it's probably like really important to understand that even like pre-World War One, you have an, a society at the turn of the century that is intensely repressed by the autocratic policies of the czar you know we we can like trace it all the way back to you know 1905 bloody sunday where you know you have workers that are led on the winter uh, that are marched to the winter palace and then there's you know open shooting and it essentially just galvanizes this anger against the czarist regime. And that's there for years before World War One kicks off, which then just adds another layer of repression and, you know, war induced hardships on the people that are already hurting the most. And you just keep layering on and layering on all of the the hardships that they're going to be facing over the last couple decades. To your point, right, like decades can happen in a week. And I think we've seen decades happen now and 
something has to give at this point. Yeah, I think it's it's so important to remember that, right? Because this is decades in the making. People are really, really struggling. And, you know, when you're sending your sons off to war and you're struggling to just keep your home intact, intact and then you get the letter or you get someone saying, hey, your sons are all killed, you know, in war. I can only imagine what this is doing to so many families. But my goodness, the anger that's there, you know, what are we fighting this war for? The czar has gone. Why are we still here? Just give some territory away. Who cares? Let's let's get some peace. And I'm sure that's a lot of what people were feeling. And you're right. Just so many years of just being ground down. It's just it's time. You know, it's time for a change. And this is what happens. You know, like we said, decades happen and nothing happens. You know, decades are about to happen in a few weeks. So Lenin, he's in exile in in Switzerland, and he's almost salivating at this opportunity, right? The czar is gone. He sees this weak government. He's trying everything he can, even before this time, to get back to Russia. But here's the problem. He's in Switzerland, and he's a Russian citizen, and there's a big German country in the way that he needs to get through <laughs> to get to Russia. So he can't just cross the border and try to walk through Germany. He'll be arrested instantly as a spy or something like that. But then the German government gets wise and goes, wait a second, we can kick Russia out of this war. This is going to be huge. It's going to close one of the fronts for us. And so the German government and Lenin get in touch and they basically ship Lenin back to Russia. I think they send him up through Finland and then he comes down into Russia from the north. But this is very clever by the Germans, right? Is oh, yeah. If we can destabilize Russia even more, and all Lenin's been talking about is how we're going to get out of this war, we're going to get out of this war. If we can send him back and he can get a little bit of power, you know, maybe even get some influence, this is great for us, right? This is going to end the war on the Eastern Front, and, you know, we can reposition and really try to, to win things on the Western Front. So he's, he's on his way back, and when he gets back, he right away delivers his famous April thesis, which is a radical document that had three main things. Immediate end to the war, which music to the ears of the Germans, transfer of all political power to Soviets, which is essentially a workers' council, and the nationalization of all land and banks. So, you know, hey, this is... This is you know what you would expect from someone like Lenin, right? This is his radical ideas, and to be honest, most people are like, "Are you sure you want to do all that?" Like, I get the ending of the war part. I understand some of this political transfer, but we're going to nationalize everything. This is, are you sure this is going to work? And even within the Bolshevik Party, there is a little bit of skepticism around: can this even work? But he has this unwavering conviction. He has. He's a very good orator and he kind of just gradually works people over. He's not, I would say, someone like, you know, we think of like a Hitler, right? Coming up with very radical ideas and very galvanizing with the way he speaks. Uh, Lenin is, he's a good speaker, but he's not in the same way, kind of that raw, raw type of um, speech. It's just, it's really good, really thought through ideas and really good use of words as he's speaking. So slowly but surely, he's winning over the Bolshevik parties. He's winning over workers. And most importantly, he's winning over soldiers. There's a lot of disillusioned soldiers who are just not happy with this provisional government's inability to address issues like war and land reform. And so now you're starting to see people saying, OK, there needs to be an alternative to this provisional government. This Lenin guy seems to be might be a little bit on the radical side, but if he's going to help me end the war, if he's going to help with some of our land issues, I can deal with the other things. And you can start to see more and more people starting to flock to his banner. And he's starting to get a lot more power and influence within Russia. And like we said, things are going to happen very, very quickly. But this is the key point is that grinding down of the Russian people, the continuation yeah. of the war, and his very strong ability to bring people together and understand what their issues are and kind of link it together with his ideology. It's working so well for him at this point. It's going to happen very, very quickly as people start to move away from being loyal to not only the czarist regime or to the provisional government, but even becoming more radicalized, even for the moderate, more left-leaning revolutionaries. Yeah, I think that's such a great summary. And I think it's super important, not just in this context, but I think across all of our episodes and things we haven't even covered yet, like, you know, the ability ability of leaders to galvanize people by great communication and oratory skills cannot be understated. All it takes is someone who obviously is very intelligent, like Lenin is. He's thought long and hard about his ideas. He understands the pains, the grievances of, of the Soviets, of the people that he represents. And here he comes just from the shadows to galvanize them together and actually 
communicate to them that, you know, I'm here for you. We have a plan and it's going to help remediate all of the issues that you're dealing with and you have dealt with. And it's not just one individual area that he's trying to fix. You know, the military's in shambles. The government's not working effectively. The economy is pretty much backwards at this point because of what happened in World War One. You know, it's almost like it sounds like a failed state to a certain degree. So you have to, I, I imagine that for your average person to hear Lenin speak is going to give you some iota of hope. And what more do you need amongst such a massive population? Absolutely. It's just the perfect situation for him. And he's the perfect guy to kind of bring it all together. I know that's kind of, of course, I'm saying that <laughs> because it happens, but you can really see how this comes together. You need someone who's strong enough with an ideology that can galvanize people has the tactical ability to actually go and execute it. But then you have to have to have these conditions. And it's just the conditions are so perfect for what he needs to do. But again, he he adapts and he finds his way in and, you know, he's patient when he needs to be, but when he's decisive when he needs to be. So really quickly, Lenin's back. It's October 1917. And he starts to look him and Leon Trotsky, which was his close um, ally within all of this. They're in Petrograd, which is today's St. Petersburg. And they're like, I think there's a chance here that we could run a coup. And so the Bolsheviks, they seize key institutions in, in Petrograd, including the Winter Palace, which was the seat of the provisional government. And this event, known as the October Revolution, marked the beginning of the Bolshevik dictatorship and the end of and really the end of true autocratic rule in Russia. So the Tsar had been overthrown, but you know, there's still it's still quite autocratic. And just a quick note about the storming of the Winter Palace. So this is this supposed to be a, you know, very galvanizing thing for the Bolsheviks. They talk about how, you know, we came in and we fought and we took over the Winter Palace. <laughs> it's actually quite funny because I don't think a single person died during this coup. The story goes that the well, the non-propaganda version of the story was they showed up at the Winter Palace, kind of hanging out outside, and then somebody found out that a back window was open, and they all just kind of went in the back window and walked in. And they're like, "We're here, we're taking over." And the, all the government officials are like, "Well, all right, like I, there's nothing we can do, right?" There's all these guys, armed guys, who have come in, and all right, go ahead, and now you've taken over. But again, it's not very romantic. So the propaganda version kind of shows more of a you know a battle between you know the old ways and the new ways, and you know the Bolsheviks end up winning, and you know that kind of stuff. So right away, they take power. And the very first thing they do is they need to transform this political landscape. They pull out of World War One, and they actually negotiate a very harsh peace with the Germans, where they ceded vast territories in exchange for peace. But there's a couple of funny things that happened during this peace treaty. One is when they showed up for the peace treaty, they really wanted to show that this was the people, you know, the people of Russia are here to negotiate. So they brought dock workers, farmers, blacksmiths, factory workers. They brought in just a bunch of regular people, but they were supposed to bring a peasant and they just forgot. <laughs> so they were like, oh no, we need a peasant. So they just find some guy off the street who looked kind of disheveled and they were like, you want to be our peasant? And he's like, sure. So he's sitting in these, you know, he's sitting next to some German prince and the story goes that the waiter asks, would you like white or red wine? And he turns to the German prince and goes, which one is stronger? So this is this kind of, I like these stories because it's just, it's two completely different worlds coming together. And I'm sure this guy had the time of his life, probably the best meal he's ever eaten in his life. And, you know, sitting at table with princes and nobles and all these types of people, but you know, they're able to kind of get the treaty signed. But one of the things that I think is interesting is Trotsky kind of just says to the Germans, yeah, we're just leaving that territory. And they're like, okay, but are we at war? Are we at peace? He's like, no, we're just leaving. And so this is weird thing where the Russians just kind of leave and the Germans are like, wait, is this official peace? Like, do we have a signed peace treaty? They've just left. So it's not really war anymore. What the heck is going on? So there's kind of this confusion that's kind of thrown into all of this. And I think it just kind of goes to show that, yeah, we're not signing peace treaties in this traditional way as before. We got our own things to deal with. You guys figure it out. And it kind of just sets off this really weird footing um, between the Germans and the and the Soviets, I guess, at this point. So it's a kind of just a weird thing that happens. But long story short, the war is over. Soldiers are starting to come home and it's not just, hey, the Bolsheviks have taken over and the old regime's gone and we just move on as business as usual. There's a lot of people who want power and see an opportunity that aren't Bolsheviks. And there's still a lot of people that are loyal to the provisional government and to the Tsarist regime. And they're not just going to fall over and say, oh, great, let's do this revolution. Let's change everything. You can take my land. You can nationalize my industries. No problem. You know, there's going to be a lot of fighting that's going to come up to to see who's going to really win out at the end of the day. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a total transformation of Russia we're talking about, right? At this point, we have um, the czarist regime, the autocracy that's been in power for, you know, what, three centuries that 
is gone, no longer existent, and you have the transformation of Russia into a socialist state. And, you know, outside of the scope of this particular discussion, but, you know, we're essentially seeing the stage set for the global spread of, of communism. It's a super complex legacy. We're talking about advancements of workers' rights and social reforms, which, you know, sound sounds great. You know, we, we want that. But, you know, the other side of the coin is that what what we're inevitably going to get into, I think, right now is how is this actually implemented? How is this actually done? And this is one of the great like, contradictions uh, of this ideology, especially in this particular historical context, is, again, the rise of authoritarianism and political repression. You know, understanding that the Bolsheviks, to comprehend these really broad narratives and these dynamics, they have to have a strategic direction for key figures like, you know, Trotsky, Lenin, you know, they're seizing all these infrastructure points and they're trying to transform Russia. But Russia is a very big place. <laughs> there is a massive population. And I know we've been saying that a lot of, you know, a, a portion of the population definitely agrees with Lenin, but there are definitely also pockets of people who are subversive and do not like the direction that the Bolsheviks are going to go. Absolutely. And it's very key to remember the Bolsheviks are not a majority by any stretch of the imagination no. at this point. They're definitely the most organized. They're definitely the most effective at what they do. They're able to do a lot more with less. And I think part of it is having a good leader and being a little bit more grounded in what they want to do versus some of the more liberal kind of um, less radical folks who are kind of humming and hawing about what they want to do. But you're right. There's the socialist revolution revolutionaries. There's these more liberal um, socialist um, factions. You have people who are still loyal to the czar. You have people who are a bit more on the conservative side and maybe want to see their own thing. They're all going to have want a piece of this. And so that kicks off the Russian Civil War, which takes place over five years. And I think coming into this, I always thought of the revolution as very a quick thing. Tsar is killed, Lenin comes in, Bolsheviks take over, Soviet Union starts, we move on. But it's really about five big years of war between the socialist red army led by the Bolsheviks and the white army, which was non-Bolsheviks. And so just even starting out with this, a year into kind of this leadership role, Lenin survives an assassination attempt. So he's actually shot twice in a speech in Moscow. You know, he was seen as, again, someone said, you're a betrayer of the revolution. This person was captured and executed quite quickly. This did a lot to harm Lenin's health. So we'll get into why that's important a little bit later. But again, you can already start to see that people are willing to go to, try, you know, trying to assassinate him, trying to take him out because they don't agree with his specific type of ideology. And so now, and you mentioned this a couple of times when you were going through the you know, Marxist ideology and how it transformed into Leninism, that revolutionary guard and that centralized control. And that's mm -hmm. really, really key what's coming up here. And so I know we talked about a little bit before around you know war communism. So I don't know, maybe you want to kick us off and, and talk a little bit about war communism, because I think this is the most important part, really seeing Lenin go from this ideologue who's pragmatic, who understands what needs to be done to kind of a bit of a tyrant at this point. And I think this is a big change in kind of the the view that we've set with Lenin up to this point of, hey, he's someone who's taking advantage of a situation, but he's really taking advantage of a situation in this point. And it's, you know, not by spreading good word and, and cheer to everybody <laughs> with great I ideas. It's it's time to get violence and it's time to really repress the people who are pushing back against him. Yeah, I think this is probably the most complicated part of this in entire discussion for me because it's so dynamic and multifaceted so when you know we've talked about the red army so this is led by the bolsheviks um they're committed to a socialist state based on marxist or leninist principles again paul you mentioned that they're highly organized they're disciplined they're emphasizing ideological unity and control and i think for our listeners keep that last component in mind because that is essentially the backdrop against what's going to happen the white army uh, or the whites, the red versus the whites. It's this group of monarchists. They're trying to restore the czar. They're liberals supporting a democratic government, nationals seeking independence for various regions, socialist factions. And, you know, there's many prominent figures within the white army, but there's no unified command. There's no coherent ideology. So there's fragmented efforts against the reds. And you also have other foreign intervention that is happening this time as well, which is very interesting. And if you're looking at foreign intervention, you have the allies who aim to support anti-Bolshevik forces by securing war supplies, 
preventing the spread of communism, Japan, who's occupied parts of Siberia and supported uh, the White Army, but their presence was limited. You have American expeditionary forces who participated in operations, the North Russia campaign, but faced challenges. So they didn't really do much. So, you know, there's there's foreign intervention happening during the Civil War, provide temporary aids to the White Army, but fail to tip the balance in favor and often fueled the very national sentiments that undermine their efforts. And now we can pivot to the Civil War and the Red Terror that's about to take hold, which is, you know, we mentioned this is a brutal civil war. It lasts about five years. It's between the Reds and the Whites. And it essentially creates this opportunity for the Bolsheviks to put their plan into action ideologically, this vanguard party, this state control. And this is how we end up with the Red Terror. And you're seeing widespread atrocities happening, immense human suffering. There's an estimated 7 to 12 million deaths due to combat, famine, and disease. The Bolsheviks ultimately triumphed by consolidating their power. But, you know, through campaigns like the Red Terror, which wanted to implement this very strong centralized control, led to the establishment of the Soviet Union. But we're talking about forced labor camps, government or, uh, you know, oversight into any like, working group or, or group that might be undermining the, the Bolshevik identity and what their uh, uh, goals are. You're uh, seeing these authoritarian measures to a degree that, you know, you could almost swap out Bolsheviks for autocratic or czarist. And you, you would might think I'm thinking about one or the other and you wouldn't even be able to tell the difference. You have a secret police force that's created, the Cheka, which was granted expansive powers to arrest, imprison, execute anyone they deemed enemies of the state with any formal trial. It is a campaign of massive political repression mass killings and it was a it was, there was actually an official announcement on the red terror in September 1918 in an attempt to uh in in I'm sorry in response to assassination attempts on the Bolshevik leaders including Lenin and they wanted to target former czarist officials clergy bourgeoisie intellectuals suspected counter revolutionaries so you can see just by the way I'm communicating it the, the the groups that they're targeting are so broad there is no time to even investigate if there is even a a shred of evidence that you are against what the Bolsheviks are doing, you're as good as dead or off to, to a work camp somewhere in Siberia. And it's a perfect opportunity too for, you may not be a counter-revolutionary, you just might have annoyed the wrong person in the right, the wrong place. And you can see how these types of things explode so quickly, but it's effective and ends up winning them. Part of the reason they win, the, they're able to win this war. But I've always tried to find where does Lenin fit into all of this? Was he part of a cog in the system? Was he kind of leading it? There's a quote from him that, you know, kind of puts, I think, this that argument to bed. And it, he says, it is necessary secret, secretly and urgently to prepare the terror. It is necessary to punish the kulaks, the priest and the white guards. So right away, it's these people are against us and we need to prepare this terror. And Really, a lot of historians look at this and they say this is a perfect example of class genocide. They look at people in a certain class and they need to be executed. And there's a really interesting thing that happens after, I think it's around some point after World War II, the UN is de debating on a formal definition of what genocide is. And the Soviet Union fights really, really hard to keep the words class out of the definition. So you're talking about race, you're talking about religion. The Soviets don't want class in there because they know... If they put class in there, people are going to look back at what happened in during this war and what's still happening in the Soviet Union as a perfect example of genocide. So a lot of historians say, yeah, this is, you know, a class genocide by any stretch of the imagination. And it's an effective one as well, because the Bolsheviks see themselves as this group of, you know, it's an ideological group and they're pushing back against anybody who's not within, you know, class or within their ideological team, for lack of a better term. And they're wiping them out, which I think is, you know, genocide and, you know, any definition that you want to describe. So it's an important thing to remember that, you know, if we really kind of put the word genocide around it, which I know is a word you have to be very careful with, and it has a very specific definition, but I think it's fair to say here, and you can see just the fact that the Soviets don't want the word class put into genocide. Side, I think kind of answers the question for you quite definitively that this is a huge version of class genocide. Yeah, I think that's such an important takeaway. And I think to underpin all of that, right, you have, I, I've never thought about that way. That's something I'm going to have to like dig deeper into after the fact. But it's such a good point. I think underpinning all of this, you know, with the civil war that's going on, the Bolsheviks implement, you know, war communism. It's a, it's a 
economic political system essentially aimed at supporting the Red Army to manage their nation's resources. So this lasts for about three years from 1918 to 1921. It essentially nationalizes of all industries, centralizes management of the economy. It forces requisition of grain and other agricultural products from peasants to feed the urban population in the military. But here's the kicker. The policies led to a severe, severe economic decline and widespread famine. Industrial output essentially plummeted due to very poor resource management. You had worker strikes and the disruption caused by the Civil War. Peasants started to resist grain requisition by reducing production to deflate their numbers. They were hoarding supplies, actively revolting. And you have this combination again. You know, it's like we're just repeating a cycle. Uh, The combination of food shortages, disease, and the breakdown of infrastructure leads to the deaths of millions of people from starvation and hardship. The very people that the Bolsheviks claim to be here to support. Yeah, it's a... I almost can give them a small pass because this is kind of the first time this big nationalization movement ever happened. And again, did they know this was going to happen? Maybe yes or no. But regardless, the outcome is horrendous. You know, millions are dead from this famine that lasts for about a year and a half to two years. But there's a really interesting story here that's kind of a bit of a side note, just kind of within the context of the famine. Maybe not so much a side note, actually, because Lenin's got a, a key piece in this, and then it kind of there's a bit of a side note. So Lenin, this is where we see him pivot a little bit. He puts out the word to the world and says, basically, we need help. We have too many people dying. We can't feed all of these people. We need help from we're willing to let people come in. If people want to send food, we're totally open to that, which again, if we think of someone like Stalin during the 1930s, when the Ukrainians were all starving, he pretended it didn't, wasn't happening, kind of pushed it forward a little bit. So you can kind of see the two sides of Lenin versus Stalin on this point. But the Americans have a massive role in saving a lot of lives here. So there was something called the American Relief Administration. And so they supported Russia here and they fed over 10 million people daily with food coming out of the US, three sorry, 768 million tons of flour, grain, rice, beans, pork, milk, and sugar with a value of almost 100 million was transported to Russia after it was collected in the US. They used 237 ships. They had 200 Americans directing it with the support of 125,000 Russians for unloading, warehousing, hauling, cooking, serving food and almost 21,000 new kitchens that were set up in Russia. And there's a quote here that I have from someone named Howard Ramsey, who is a newspaper editor. He says, for almost two years, now a scant 200 Americans on a battle line far longer than the Western Front have been seen fighting a foe more pitless than any allied armies, any army the allies faced. From the Baltic to the Caspian Sea, from Crimea to the Urals, they have conquered the famine, saved more lives than were lost in, in the World War, healed, it healed early suffering people of the diseases which threatened to sweep the whole of Europe, won the benedictions of a great but stricken nation, achieved the world's greatest ad- adventure in humanity. So it's a little bit of a side note. And again, we talk so much about in history how things kind of just are become footnotes. This is something that I kind of just stumbled across. And I was like, I'm going to look a little bit more into the famine. And then you start to read things like this. And it's, yeah, there was a terrible famine. But, you know, 200 Americans help with 125,000 Russians feeding 10 million people a day. Talk about, he says at the end here, achieve the world's greatest adventure in humanity. And so for all the terrible things that happen, it's always nice to see that at the end of the day, humans are able to to do some really wonderful things for a lot of people. So I think it's always a, you know, for a really awful time for the world, it's always nice to see a little bit of good come out of it. But even like, it's, it's, it's a powerful story and I'm glad you shared that. And like the first thing that kind of sticks out to me is the irony of it in 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 such a way right you have the growing most uh probably one of the more powerful countries if not the most powerful country at this point in in north america that is democratic capitalist imperial that is now shifting their you know directive to support and help the russian population which is vehemently well at least at the at the at the at the highest forms of government pretty much cannot contend with how that country is operating and ideologically are total polarities. Yeah, it is always you see little nuggets of this right yeah. on. We're so ideologically in our in our ways. Our ideologies messed up a lot of things, and then our capitalist friends have come and helped save ten million people's lives potentially. Yeah, you know? and I think this this might be an interesting point because uh, we talked about like a bit of a macro example there on how these polarities kind of exist at this point in time and still do today, but even at the ground level. So, you know, Lenin's a a pretty pragmatic guy. 
and he sees and recognizes the unstable nature of war communism. So in 1921, he introduces the new economic policy. It is a marked and strategic retreat from full straight control, state control. It allows for a mixed economy with elements of capitalism. Small and medium-sized businesses were permitted to operate privately. Peasants could sell surplus produce on the open market. And foreign investment was cautiously encouraged. Its aim was to revive the economy by incentivizing production and alleviating the dire conditions of the population that they were facing. Ultimately, it succeeded (laughs) in stabilizing the economy to some extent. It led to uh, increased agricultural and industrial output, but... It also, as you know, you could probably infer, created a lot of internal tension within the party about the direction of the revolution and the ideological compromises involved in adapt uh, in adopting capitalist practices. Yeah, it's it's a tough one for them, right? Because they needed to do something because, again, 10 million people are being fed a day by food coming in from America and other places in Europe and um, in the West. So that's not looking too good for, you know, the Russian system. And especially now that they've kind of made these changes and things are happening, like I even heard stories about they abolish a bunch of banks and they try to have it more part of their state owned bank operation, but they're not finding enough people who actually know how to run banks. So they got to go back to some of these older guys who they kicked out and said, yeah, I kind of need you to come back. We'll make it work. We have this new policy now. It's going to be great. So you start to see a little bit of this. And again, credit to Lenin and the Bolsheviks for being able to adapt. But again, it was kind of a mess that not they didn't necessarily fully make. I think there was a lot of issues before, but they definitely made it worse, I think, by a lot of these nationalization movements. But you're right. You can see that things are going going to change a little bit within the party and you know this revolutionary stance and this tight hold on ideology you know i think it's going to be very interesting where where the soviet union moves next right because lenin's about to die in about three or four years and there's a big thing that's going to have to happen next on what's the direction they're going to go and are they going to go more kind of and we were talking about this before on look how china is today you have a very ideological communist party but you have a lot of capitalist elements in there and you're you're kind of finding this balance where china has for all its problems is doing quite well economically in a lot of areas is this which way is the soviet union going to go is it going to double down on that ideology tighten things up or is it going to open up a little bit and find you know maybe a nice balance and so i this is a good time to just kind of wrap up kind of Lenin's life because it ends quite quickly for him, unfortunately. He's able to build this socialist system, build the Soviet Union, and then he kind of just dies. And once it's stable, he's really not able to push it in the direction or kind of lead it for a long time. So in 1922, his health is, it's really not in good shape. He suffered a couple strokes. He's partially paralyzed. And he's kind of marginalized from political life. He's really concerned about the future of the revolution. He's starting to see people around him as just looking at them with suspicions. And most importantly, he's looking at Stalin. And he's starting to realize that he's propped Stalin up over all these years. And he recognizes that Stalin is going to be the one who's going to take over when he dies. And so in the final years of his life, his Lenin's was so sick. He actually asked Stalin to give him a cyanide pill because he was in so much pain. But Stalin refused to do that. And then a lot of historians say Stalin recognized that he needed Lenin to be alive for a little bit longer to just kind of stabilize everything. And then he'd be able to grab power. So you can already see Lenin is, or sorry, Stalin is a little bit of a cruel guy, right? Even someone who's been so close with is begging for death, saying, just get me out of this intense pain that I'm in. And he refuses to do so. And so we start to see Lenin start to look at Stalin and he writes something called Lenin's Testaments, which was a series of letters between December 1922 and January 1923, where he was really concerned about Stalin. So he mentioned things about the concentration of power. He's starting to see Stalin put in people that he's close to, bringing them into the government, which, again, starting to centralize power around him more than the party. He doesn't like Stalin's character. He describes him as very rude. He was actually quite mean to Lenin's wife. And Lenin actually had to confront Stalin and make him apologize for these sort of things. And there's always kind of this heightened tension. And at the very end, he says he he recommends that Stalin actually be removed from his general secretary position. So obviously, these letters are very much suppressed after Lenin's death, because there's no way these can come out, especially with Stalin in charge. Lenin recognizes that he goes, I need someone who's patient, loyal, courageous, and actually considerate to his fellow comrades. And he recognizes that Stalin is kind of a bit of a monster. He recognizes this very quickly. But unfortunately, Lenin dies on January 21st, 1924, at the age of 53. This is the famous pictures of him, his body's embalmed and placed in a 
mausoleum in Red Square, where it remains, you know, a symbol today, you know, of the revolution. But, you know, Stalin's able to take power and really lead the Soviet Union into a completely different era. So there's a little bit of fun alternative history here. If, you know, if Lenin had lived five, 10 years longer, would Stalin have taken over and a little bit more violently? Would Lenin have been able to steer the course a bit better? Who knows? But, you know, the Soviet Union is at a point now where it's it's ready to take that next step. And it's going to come from a leadership level and is going to go in a very different direction, I think, than Lenin had originally hoped when you know, he started off on this revolutionary journey. That's a powerful end. Um, those, those oh, sorry. And that was a series of uh, letters that he had written. He did. Yeah. And I, again, they weren't really, nobody really knew that they were being written um, sure. because I think yeah, as soon as he died, those were stuffed away somewhere where no one, they would never see the light of day again. But yeah, he was, in a lot of his writings, he's very, very concerned about Stalin. And, you know, he sees that, you know, the whole part of this socialist movement in the Soviet Union is this collection of comrades and everybody's equal and those sort of things. And you have this, you know, general secretary, not a president, not a, you know, leader, but essentially, for lack of a better term, a king, an emperor, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, it goes by a different name. And I think Lenin actually had a bit of a, he understood what that role meant, you know, not mm-hmm. to be yep. a total autocratic ruler. But Stalin, he can start to see he's having different ideas and he's starting to put people in the right positions to make sure that he can accomplish that. So, you know, he's a very good judge of character. I'll give him that. Yeah, this is a, it's a pretty, it, it's, it's, almost a tragic kind of ending to our discussion in a way because his leadership is pretty short-lived it's like three or four years right before he dies yeah he um, never gets to kind of experience he created this thing and he never kind of is able to take it in and and run something that's a little bit more stable he's kind of trying to juggle all these things together gets it together and then unfortunately passes away yeah it's, it brings it's a quick ending to a life of someone who i kind of now see it, it, it's a contentious you know analysis as a leader right like he's a visionary he's the architect of a revolution he's extremely strategic he's tactical he's organized uh, he's opportunistic in some ways he's inspirational to the soviets um but you know there's always that that but whenever we do these is that he's he also had points of his life and leadership where he did implement authoritarian methods um he did implement economic policies that caused undue hardship to the people that he wanted to serve he could you could potentially argue that he laid a bit of a foundation for future totalitarianism and the centralization of power which you know stalin or someone like him could establish a total totalitarian regime without that much effort because there was a precedent already set so yeah it's it's uh it's contentious i think there's a lot to admire about him in some ways and like you know all historical realities there's always a dark side to the good absolutely and i i want to kind of maybe finish off here i've got like a paragraph and a half here from a historian called victor sebenson who wrote a book on on lenin and i he kind of goes through a few things here that I think just, I think really wraps up Lenin in a very, I think it's probably one of the most fair analysis that I've seen. And I think it lines up a lot with what we said. So he describes Lenin. He says he was not a monster, a sadist, or personally victus. In personal relationships, he was unvariably kind and his behavior reflected in the way he was brought up like an upper middle class gentleman. He was not vain. He could laugh even occasionally at himself. He was not cruel like Stalin or Mao or Hitler. He never asked for for details about the victim's death in order to savor those moments. He never donned military uniforms or military type tunics as favored by other dictators. But during his years of feuding with fellow revolutionaries and battling to maintain his grip on power, he never showed generosity to a defeated opponent, nor performed a humanitarian act unless it was politically expedient. He built a system based on the idea of political terror against his opponents was justified for the greater end, and it was perfected by his successor, Joseph Stalin. But the ideas were Lenin. He had not always been a bad man, but he did do terrible things. One of his old comrades mentioned that she really grew to fear and loathe him, Observes, observing specifically that the tragedy of Lenin, she said, was that he desired good, but created evil. And the historian here wraps up by saying, the worst of Lenin's evils was that he left a man like Stalin in, in a position to lead Russia after him. And that was a historic crime. I think that sums it up well. Like, I, I don't have anything to add to that. I think is extremely accurate and would have taken me weeks <laughs> to summarize <laughs> my thoughts in a similar way. Yeah, we can thank these PhDs who spend, you know, a lot of time learning about people, but I I love it, right? It's you see a person who's not a traditional dictator. He's not some crazy guy who's doing all these things. He's just so ideologically driven and almost so pragmatic and understands what he, you know, he, the ends justify the means 
for him it seems like in most situations and um yeah he created something that a person like Stalin, Mao or Hitler with the tools that he created is going to create something quite sinister and quite evil and that ends up what's happening but at the end of the day as a person I think we can say Lenin was I wouldn't say good guy or anything like that I think that's obviously not a good way to say but again a person who you can relate with as an, a normal type of person but when it came down to being a leader very very effective but yeah. also can be oh yeah i wouldn't say cruel but just never again never justified never is able to come back and do something that was nice for someone or a, the right thing to do from a humanity standpoint unless it impacted him directly yeah so i think that was a, a really good way to kind of sum it up and yeah you know definitely the putting stalin in charge not necessarily it was his choice and we could see at the end that he was not a fan but you know he created the system that allowed stalin to, to flourish and you know we kind of know how that ends for for russia so so, yep. yeah, I think that's definitely a good way to wrap it up. And I think, yeah, this has been a, a fascinating kind of wrap up to this incredibly interesting time in, in Russian history. So uh, thank everyone for listening to if you've listened to all three. Um, thank you for sticking around for learning a little <laughs> bit of Russian history. But if you haven't listened to the other episodes, we have our two episodes on Rasputin and on Tsar Nicholas II, where we get into a little bit more of what's happening in Russia into a lot more detail. So definitely check those out. But yeah, we will uh, be back next week as we start exploring uh, some other point in history. History. So uh, we'll see you all then. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the History in Motion podcast. If you enjoyed our journey through time, please subscribe, rate us, share the podcast with friends. Your support helps keep history alive. Until next time.